The Sahel looked like dust and death. Yet in 1983, Tony Rinaldo dug beneath the surface and saw green where everyone else saw none. The official story called Niger's lands barren and doomed. The real transformation came not from planting trees, but from protecting a hidden underground forest, root systems that outperformed every expensive project on Earth. If millions of trees and food security emerged from simply changing what farmers cut or kept, what else are we missing beneath the world's empty lands? If understanding solutions like this matters to you, real answers hidden in plain sight, take a moment to support the work by liking the video and subscribing. Because cases like this are changing how we think about land, food, and survival. And this is where the story truly begins. Tony Rinaldo stepped out onto the parched roadside near Maradi in 1983 surrounded by fields that stretched dry and empty to the horizon. Dust clung to his boots, and the only signs of life seemed to be scattered tufts of brittle grass and what everyone dismissed as useless brush. He knelt down, drawn by the stubborn shoots poking through the sand, shoots most farmers saw as weeds to be cleared for crops. He reached for one of the stumps, its bark rough and sun-bleached. With a small knife, he scraped away the outer layer, Beneath the surface, a sliver of green appeared, living tissue, not the dead wood he had expected. The cambium glistened, moist and vibrant, a thin line of proof that life still pulsed beneath the dust. In that moment, the landscape shifted. What had looked barren from above was, in fact, hiding a vast network below. An underground forest, alive and waiting. Ronaldo pressed his fingers into the soil, feeling the coolness near the roots. Each stump, it turned out, belonged to a tree that had once grown tall before being cut down in harder years. The roots had survived drought, fire, and decades of neglect, sending up new shoots every season, only to be cut back again and again. Decades of well-meaning effort had missed this simple truth. The forest was not gone, just hidden. For years, experts and aid workers had brought seedlings and nurseries, convinced that planting new trees was the only path forward. But here, in the quiet shade beneath his hand, Ronaldo recognized the evidence that would overturn all those assumptions. The answer was not in what could be added, but in what was already there. If only someone would notice and let it grow. The Sahel's secret was not its emptiness, but its patience. Life was waiting just below the surface, ready to return if given the chance. Across the Sahel, the rhythm of farming life followed a simple routine. Each year, as fields were prepared for planting, farmers moved through their land with hoes and machetes, clearing away anything that might compete with their crops. Sprouts and shoots, what many called weeds, were cut back before they could grow tall. This practice was widespread, handed down from one generation to the next, and seen as essential for survival in a region where every grain counted. The intent was never destruction. In these communities, land was precious and hard won. Clearing new shoots, protected millet and sorghum from competition, kept fields tidy, and reduced the risk of pests. For decades, this ritual was part of the unwritten rules of good farming. No one questioned whether these stubborn shoots might be more than just brush. No one imagined that beneath the dry surface, roots from old trees were still alive, sending up green signals of hope each rainy season. But every cut, every sweep of the blade, erased a chance for the land to heal itself. Without realizing it, farmers were locked in a cycle, removing the very growth that could have restored fertility, shade, and resilience to their fields. The underground forest stayed hidden, its energy forced back below ground year after year, the cost of this habit was invisible but immense. As the years passed, soils grew thinner, winds picked up more dust, and crops struggled in the relentless sun. Yet the answer lay just beneath their feet, suppressed not by malice, but by a tradition rooted in caution and necessity. Changing this pattern would require more than new tools or seeds. It would take a new way of seeing the land, not as empty, but as quietly alive, waiting for protection instead of removal. Every farmer in Niger already owns the tools needed for regeneration, 
A sharp machete, a sturdy hoe, a pair of hands, nothing more. The process begins at the start of the growing season, while fields are being readied for crops. Instead of clearing every shoot, the farmer walks the rows looking for the strongest stems rising from old stumps. From each cluster, just a handful, usually one to five, are chosen to keep. The rest are pruned away, letting the selected stems reach for the sky without competition. This selection takes minutes, not hours. No seedlings, no fertilizer, no irrigation, just choosing and cutting. Once the stems are chosen, the farmer trims away side branches and weak shoots every few months. This is not a new chore. It fits neatly into the rhythm of tending crops. Training takes less than a week and often just a day. Stories spread quickly. In Maradi, a farmer learned the method on a Monday and by Friday had taught his brother and two neighbors. No outside experts are needed. No imported supplies. The same knife used for harvesting millet now shapes the next generation of trees. The simplicity is what makes the method unstoppable. There is no need to wait for aid shipments or government programs. Any farmer, young or old, can master the technique after watching it done once. In a region where every extra task must earn its place, the method called FMNR, which stands for Farmer Managed Natural Regeneration, slips into daily life without demanding more. The land begins to change almost at once because the only real input is a decision to let the underground forest breathe again. Roots that have waited decades hold a kind of advantage no nursery can match. Beneath the Sahel surface, these networks reach deep, sometimes several meters below ground, tapping moisture and nutrients far beyond the reach of any new seedling. Many of these root systems are 20 to 50 years old. They have survived drought, fire, and years of grazing. When a farmer chooses to protect a living stump, they are not starting from scratch. They are giving a head start to a tree that already knows how to survive. This biological legacy changes everything. Where a newly planted seedling might struggle to reach even one meter in height, a protected stem can shoot up three to five meters in just two or three years. The difference is not subtle. Deep roots mean access to water during the harshest dry seasons when surface soils crack and crops wilt. Veteran roots pull up minerals and moisture from layers untouched by the sun, feeding the new growth above. Survival rates tell the rest of the story. While traditional planting in the Sahel often sees only 15 to 40 percent of seedlings make it through the first year, nearly every protected stump survives and thrives. The numbers are clear, near 100 percent survival without irrigation or fertilizer. Local species, already adapted to the region's heat and drought, return on their own. The land recovers not by fighting nature, but by working with the strength already stored below. This is why fields that once seemed hopeless can become woodlands again in a matter of seasons, not decades. Stretching across southern Nigeria, the transformation covers a sweep of land few could have imagined possible. Five to six million hectares now support living trees, an area rivaling the entire nation of Denmark. This is not a patchwork of isolated fields, but a continuous comeback that spans the regions of Maradi and Zinda, where village after village has adopted the same simple practice. The numbers alone are almost hard to grasp. On a map, the restored zone forms a green belt at the edge of the Sahara, visible even in satellite images. Where once the land offered little more than dust and brittle grass, there now stands a living mosaic of trees and farms, each hectare shaped by the choices of local families. What makes this scale remarkable is not just its size, but its origin. No government decree or international project carved out these boundaries. Instead, the restoration spread organically, one farmer teaching another, one field at a time until the collective effort rewrote the landscape of an entire region. The Maradi and Zinda districts became the epicenter of this quiet revolution, their fields now dotted with the shade of native trees that had been hidden in plain sight for decades. This is the world's largest farmer-led restoration, measured not in seedlings planted, but in hectares healed by the hands of those who live on the land. The change is not theoretical or confined to demonstration plots. It is mapped, 
measured, and lived every day by the communities who decided to give the underground forest a chance to rise. The next chapter unfolds in these same fields, where restored land now supports new harvests and a future once thought lost. In fields once stripped bare by wind and sun, the return of trees brought more than shade. They brought a surge in harvests. As branches spread and roots anchored the soil, farmers began to notice subtle changes. The air felt cooler, the ground held moisture longer, and crops pushed up stronger through the earth. Grain yields responded first, where millet and sorghum once struggled, harvests climbed by 20% to 100%, depending on the year and the care given to regrowing trees. This was not a small bump. The difference meant food on the table through the lean months and enough surplus to sell at market or store for hard times. Year after year, the pattern held. Trees protected young plants from scorching winds and slowed the loss of precious topsoil. Fallen leaves and pruned branches added organic matter to the ground and fed future crops. Roots reached deep, pulling up water and nutrients that would otherwise stay locked away. In the best seasons, the collective gain was staggering, an estimated 500,000 tons of extra grain each year across the restored regions. That is enough to feed millions, not just in good years, but during droughts when every sack of millet matters most. Farmers found new resilience in the face of uncertainty. They spoke of fields that stayed green while others wilted, of harvests that withstood dry spells, and of a sense of security that had not existed for decades. Trees provided fodder for livestock from pruned branches, sustainable fuel wood from managed growth, and income from fruit and nuts. These benefits multiplied through communities as neighbors learned to manage the underground forest. The underground forest was not just a return of trees, it was a return of hope, measured in every bag of grain carried home. Restoring land in the Sahel has long been seen as a problem that demands big budgets and heavy machinery. But in Niger, the numbers tell a different story. The cost of farmer-managed natural regeneration comes in at just $14 to $20 per hectare. That is not a typo. $14 to $20, enough to buy a few bags of grain or a single hand tool, covers everything needed for a farmer to bring an entire hectare of land back to life. Break down the expenses and the simplicity becomes clear. Most of the cost goes to a day or two of training showing farmers how to select and prune the best shoots. The rest is labor, but not the kind that requires hiring crews or renting equipment. It is the farmer's own hands, already at work in the fields. There are no seedlings to buy, no nurseries to build, no trucks to haul fragile saplings across rough roads. Every tool is already in the farmer's shed. Every step fits into the rhythms of daily life. Compare this to the old model. Traditional tree planting projects in Africa run $150 to $400 per hectare. In Ethiopia, assisted natural regeneration costs $300 to $400 per hectare. China has spent billions on its Three North Shelterbelt project, up to $3,850 per hectare, only to see 85% of planted trees die. The difference is not just a matter of scale, it is a matter of principle. Farmer-managed natural regeneration works because it avoids the hidden costs that sink so many restoration schemes, failed seedlings, lost labor, and endless supply chains. $14 buys knowledge and a willingness to protect what is already there. For every hectare restored in Niger, the savings ripple outward, freeing up resources for families, communities, even entire nations. The lesson is simple. When nature is given a chance, restoration does not have to break the bank. From the dust-blown fields of southern Niger, a quiet idea began to move. Farmers who once saw only weeds in their fields started to notice how quickly their land changed when they let the strongest shoots grow. Neighbors watched as trees returned, harvests improved, and the air felt cooler under spreading branches. Soon, word traveled beyond the villages of Maradi and Zinda. The method did not need special tools or costly supplies, just a change in habit, a willingness to protect what was already there. Market days became hubs for sharing stories. Farmers from distant regions came to see for themselves. They walked among the new woodlands, asked questions, and returned home with the simple technique in mind. In this way, knowledge moved faster than any government program or outside expert could have managed. The approach spread from family to family, village to village, 
crossing borders with every migration and marriage. Within a generation, the practice that began with a handful of fields had reached far beyond Niger. Today, farmer-managed natural regeneration is practiced in over 27 countries, stretching from the dry plains of Mali to the hills of Indonesia. Each place adapts the method to its own species and seasons, but the core idea remains unchanged, protect the living roots, and the land will heal itself. Recognition followed the results. In 2018, Tony Rinaldo received the Right Livelihood Award, often called the Alternative Nobel, for his role in helping farmers unlock nature's recovery. But the real legacy belongs to the farmers who carried the method outward, proving that restoration does not depend on massive funding or government edicts. It depends on people willing to notice what is hidden beneath their feet and to teach their neighbors how to let it rise. Across continents, the underground forest has become a global movement, rooted in the hands of those who work the land and growing stronger with every season. Right now, over 200 million trees in Niger stand as living proof that restoration does not have to be expensive or complex. As climate pressures intensify and billions of degraded hectares worldwide await revival, the lesson is clear. Sometimes the solution is already beneath our feet. The future of restoration may depend not on planting more, but on protecting what survives unseen. What else might we be overlooking?